My name is Colin Beale, uh, and I am from the University of York uh, here in the UK. Um, and I'm just going to introduce very briefly our panel uh, this morning. We're going to run through a very uh, short set of slides just describing the, some of the work that we've been doing together uh, uh, using smart software. Uh, we're going to run through quite quickly, and then there'll be lots of time, I hope, for discussions and questions. Uh, and we would really value some feedback on that. But uh, we're very short slides, very short pace of time, so we're going to be as quick as possible. And we'll just move through, don't worry, no clapping, whatever, in, you know, restrain yourselves, uh, if, if that's OK, so we can make time. Um, so uh, just to introduce everyone very briefly, uh, I'm, say, I'm Colin Beale. Uh, I work at the University of York. Uh, I'm an ecologist. And really, the illegal wildlife trade, for me, is a, a growing sideline, a profitable sideline. Um, and I've got involved in this uh, thanks to uh, colleagues in Africa, where I do most of my work in East Africa. Uh, next, we've got Drew Cronin, who is actually uh, employed by the Smart Partnership in New York, fresh off a plane. Um, uh, Andy Dobson is from the University of Edinburgh uh, and has been working on the more theoretical side of dealing with um, ranger-based data. Uh, then we've got Bistra and Milland uh, from the University of Southern California, also fresh off a plane. <laughs> uh, and they're going to be telling us about some of the work that they've been doing uh, as com uh, computer scientists uh, with the artificial intelligence side of things. Uh, and then uh, right at the far end uh, is Rohit, uh, uh, who works for WWF and implements a lot of these things and works with rangers uh, in the Far East. And he's also fresh off a plane, so uh, <laughs> it's great to see you all here. And I'll hand over to Drew to kick us off. Right. Um, so, just quickly give some some context here on smart. So, so the the <laughs> good start. Uh, so the the background here is that protected areas are are really uh, considered the, the the cornerstone of biodiversity conservation. Uh, but but generally speaking, it's considered that only about a quarter of them have you know quote unquote sound management. And uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, is address this immediate need uh, around the world uh, to improve effectiveness of protected area uh, monitoring and management efforts from the front lines uh, who want, uh, you know, rangers, they need their, to be safer in their work and they want to, uh, you know, feel that their work is of value and that they're co contributing to, uh, you know, a broader effort all the way up through national authorities that are trying to de deploy limited resources often at scale. Um, so, so what is SMART? Uh, it's the Spatial Monitoring and Reporting Tool. Theoretically, most of you, if you're here, would be familiar with that. But it's, it's a, effectively, it's a software solution. Uh, but uh, you know, we think it's a lot broader than that. It's a, it, it's a partnership. Uh, and as of now, the current SMART partnership is formed of these nine organizations here at the bottom um, that, are, that are actual partner members. But it, you know, it's much broader than that. It's a sort of a global user community. Uh, it's a set of services, it's training, it's capacity building. Um, and, and what we uh, are trying to do with, with SMART is, is to, 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 like I said, address this need where we're trying to improve uh, protected area uh, management effectiveness. So using ranger collected data, um, coming back to headquarters and provide the a basic analytical framework to uh, improve decision making and, and, and improve deployment of whatever limited resources uh, are at hand. And you know the ultimate goal, you know, it is a software solution, but we're not we're not married to the software solution. What we're trying to do is provide the best uh, tool that we can, uh, and, and to fill that gap. Um, and uh, you know, and if something else comes along, uh, or somebody else is doing something exciting, we try to work with them and bring that in, and, and try to expand our tool that way. And that's how we got involved with this group. You know, we, we want to try to, um, you know, provide users on the ground. Do I have two minutes? <laughs> we want to try. To, sorry, a light just came on. Um, we want to try to provide users on the ground with an easy-to-use tool, uh, backed with a pretty sophisticated. Um, analytical framework uh, to, 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 to make the best use of the, the, the resources on the ground. Um, so this is just a, a, 
a glimpse of the sort of scale of SMART. It's deployed in, in some way in, in over 600 sites in over 55 countries, or at least 55 countries. Uh, and it's adopted nationally in 12 countries. They're the countries that, that are highlighted in blue. Um, and you know, originally, SMART started out as a, a law enforcement, wildlife law enforcement application. But over time, it's grown to become a much more holistic protected area management platform. Um, and with each coming iteration, we'll be releasing SMART 6 later this year. With each iteration, we're adding on new services, uh, new functionality to try to provide users with this you know, sort of baseline platform with which they can use to, to, to improve their management uh, and, and enforcement efforts in their, in their protected area. Um, so just in sum, a very quick summary. Uh, it's, it's a successful platform, global reach. It's, it's driven by a global user community. It's free. It's open source. We're committed to providing uh, software that's free at the point of use for our, our community. Uh, like I said, it's supported by a global community. It's very customizable, so it's, it can adapt to the organizational needs of pretty much any site. It's, uh, it's got a long-term sustainability plan, which is different from a lot of different applications, so we're not going anywhere. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I think it's been adopted at the scale that it has been, because people know we're going to train, we're going to invest in this particular tool at our site, and it will not go anywhere. We can, you know, we can be sure that this is going to be around for the long term. Um, and what we'll be talking about here is, is this thing is we're trying to build in new and exciting functionality, new uh, technology where we can while still meeting the baseline need of our users that often in disconnected environments uh, that they need a basic um, you know, database and analytical framework for, for, for managing their protected area. With that, I will pass it over to Rohit. Thanks, Trey. I'm glad that I'm talking about the field side because I am the least uh, formal person in this meeting room, as you can see the way I'm dressed. Uh, so it's not the 14 hours flight, that's how I'm dressed and that's how I look all the time. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, quickly about the, how the smart works in the field. So before I do that, let me tell you a story. So I was, I was in northeastern India and I was asked to do ranger training. So before doing the training, park manager asked me, OK, can you go and meet the rangers before we do the training? I went there, I met the rangers, and then, like any other ranger, they started complaining that we don't have this stuff, we don't have that stuff, we have boots, but we have torches, but we don't have batteries. Then I asked them, OK, if God comes, what will you ask for? <laughs> and then my assumption was, he will say, make me park manager. Or if he's really ambitious, he will say, make me forest minister. But then you know what he said? Tell me what happens to the data which I collect or I've been collecting for 22 years. That's what SMART does. It extracts the information which has been collected by rangers, convert it into something which park managers can understand, rangers can understand. It's based on a simple adaptive management cycle where rangers go out on a patrol, they gather information, that information goes into smart system and it produces simple maps and tables. That helps you in your decision making. No other tool can do that so effectively as smart does. Uh, in simple language, what it does, it tells you where your patrols need to be. In most of the sites, we don't have enough human resources. Rangers are not Spider-Man or Superman. They can't be everywhere all the time. So you need to manage your human resource effectively. You need to put them in the right area. And SMART helps you in the decision making. Also, it helps you in the performance evaluation of rangers. It helps you to know which team is performing well. Uh, if they go out on foot patrols, are they more effective? Or if they go out on elephant patrols, then more, they are more effective. Uh, this is what it looks. It's a simple. Summary map which comes out of SMART and a, and a map showing where the patrol uh, illegal activities are happening. It helps you to, these pro, uh, maps can be produced every week, every day, every month, depending on the national park. And these help you to, uh, to allow uh, your adaptive management. This helps you to further planning of pet your patrols. That's all from my side. Who is next? Yeah. Ah, there you go. Okay, so that's a bit of background about uh, about the smart software. What what kind of data uh, 
it contains and what we want to use it for. But this is about um, predictive patrol planning, um, which will often involve quite sophisticated data analysis, modeling techniques, AI, which some of my colleagues talk about, um, uh, in order to try and improve the quality of the guidance that we can feed back to the rangers and to managers. And one obvious question would be, well, why do we need to do this, given that we already have ranger data which tells us where activities are? Um, and, and the simple answer is that even the very best ranger patrol data contain biases. Uh, now, what do I mean by biases? I don't mean mistakes. What I mean is that the routes that patrols take, or specifically the decisions that go into planning that route, as well as uh, certain features of the landscape, mean that certain illegal activities in certain areas will be more likely to be observed than others. So I can give you an example. Imagine this hypothetical landscape here. Now, here we've got um, patrols have, based upon a, on a, a past history of their patrol records, they decide they're going to follow the the route taken by the green dotted line in order to try and find some uh, elephant carcasses. And indeed, they follow that route and they find three carcasses. They don't find any snares. Now, that's fine for the sake of that patrol. It's achieved its objectives. But the thing is that if you only go looking for things that you expect to find, you get a, a distorted picture of what's happening in the rest of, the, uh, rest of your area. Um, so... Uh, Sorry, I've completely lost my thread. Um, the idea, what we want to be able to do, sorry, uh, one way of getting a better um, picture of the overall distribution of activities in the park would be to either patrol randomly or to patrol in a regular systematic fashion, for example, by following those lines here. But if you do that, you get your regular coverage, but the problem is that you'll uh, inevitably waste a huge amount of time in areas where you don't need to be, where they're not uh, a high distribution of uh, illegal activities. And, there are, and even here, even if you were to follow these kind of routes, you would still have biases that are caused, caused by features of the landscape. Uh, so, for example, it's very likely that snares will be much easier to find uh, in uh, forested areas where there's a canopy and a low undergrowth, and much harder to find in tall grassland. So, patrols following that route might actually find more snares in the forested area and conclude that snaring is more common in the north of the park, which it isn't. Conversely, it's very likely that elephant carcasses are much easier to see in the open because uh, an elephant carcass attracts scavenging birds like vultures and married blue storks, which, whose circling will alert patrols to their presence. So again, patrollers taking these kind of routes might conclude that elephant poaching is more common in the south of the park than in the north, which it isn't. So we've got these and lots of other different types of biases. Those, the biases that I've, I've talked about there are actually relatively simple and, and easy to deal with. But there's a whole range of other kind of issues that can come up in these data. So we use these data analysis and modeling to try and correct those biases and identify not only the current uh, activity hotspots, but also to try and predict where they're going to come up in the future. And this analysis will also allow us to uh, identify knowledge gaps, so try and fill in areas where we, where we lack information. And using those two constraints, we can calculate optimal patrol routes. Um, now, there's one other point here, which is not incidental to what, we were, what was spoken about in the panel before, which is that if you have uh, managers who are using the kind of software that we're going to talk about uh, to, to uh, plan routes, then they need to make an explicit decision about what it is that they're targeting, what types of activities and what kind of areas. And as, we, as you all know, uh, in, in, in most protected areas across the tropics, most of the illegal activities will be carried out by people in the lowest income brackets. They will be those with the fewest economic alternatives, people who rely upon forest products for their livelihood, and whose activities probably have the least impact on the environment. And, and those are not the people that, by and large, you'd want to be targeting at all. What we want to target are uh, commercial poachers, who may not be part of a local community, who may not even be part of that country, uh, who are, whose activities are having the greatest impact and, and people who are targeting things like rhinos for their horns uh, or elephants for ivory. Uh, and now I'm going to pass over to Helen to talk about progress on some of these approaches. Okay, so... 
Uh, I'm Milin Tambe, and I'm from the University of Southern California Center for AI and Society, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Bisra Delkina. As a computer scientist, I'm used to showing lots of slides and uh, talking quickly, so that's what I did. But I have my timer here, so I'll try to get done in five minutes regardless. So our center is focused on AI for societal benefits, and as such, three areas we've focused on, public safety and security, public health, and conservation, which is the thrust here. But let me briefly start by talking about our previous work in public safety and security, which is, uh, which is what got us into the conservation space. So uh, for the past many years, we've been using AI and game theory to assist government agencies, uh, the US Coast Guard, the TSA, uh, the airport police in my city, Los Angeles, to improve their operations, to optimize their operations as a software that's in use, uh, which flights should carry air marshals, how to patrol different ports of the United States, how to uh, see checkpoints out, uh, and uh, patrols in the Los Angeles airport. So that's all our software. And in, it, it was very inspiring when, to us, when we met colleagues uh, uh, such as Rohit and others who are in the field from Wildlife Conservation Society, WWF, and other NGOs, who indicated to us that there are similar challenges in protecting wildlife. And so the system that we've built, PAWS, Protection Assistant for Wildlife Security, functions by starting with a data set. The data set uh, usually includes features. That's the data that uh, Rohit uh, was suggested has been collected and that rangers wanted to know how it gets used. So that's the data that comes from SMART. Uh, features like distance to road, uh, distance to river, th things like that that are given in the data that, uh, that we can use in the data. And from there, via machine learning, uh, we can create a predictive model that says, uh, creates a risk map as to where poaching is likely to occur. This prediction basically says, okay, there is certain areas that are high risk and certain areas that are low risk. But just knowing that isn't sufficient in order to generate patrols because you have limited resources and you can't visit all the high risk areas and they may have different yield rates and the reactions uh, of the poachers to the patrols. And so therefore, we need a game theoretic approach that tries to optimize the use of limited resources in order to gather maximum numbers of snares and so forth. So we built this system. So for example, we've worked a lot in Queen Elizabeth National Park and Murchison Falls National Park in Uganda. And so we divide up the map into grid squares. And our goal then with machine learning is to predict per grid square, one kilometer grid square, how likely is it that a snare would be found based on the feature, based on the data set that has been collected from SMART. And so this is what we've been doing for uh, the past several years. Of course, the initial results were all in the lab. This wasn't convincing enough for our colleagues uh, in Uganda Wildlife Authority and Wildlife Conservation Society. So the question was, could we make predictions in the field? So the very first test uh, was done in 2016, where we came up with two nine square kilometer areas that were infrequently patrolled. Um, these were not previous hotspots, so you can see here two uh, nine square kilometer areas. The green dots are our predictions as to where the rangers should patrol. The red dots are what was there previously, so basically to show that the machine learning method isn't saying just go to where you previously found snares. It's asking them to go somewhere different, which were infrequently patrolled areas. And the question is, what would we find? So this was our test. And so uh, we asked rangers to patrol. This was done in uh, 2016. And so the rangers went out and patrolled. And first, we would get emails every day as to what was done today. And so the first result was a poached elephant with its tusk cut off. So that was sad, but uh, it at least told us that our system was hunting, uh, was pointing rangers in the right direction, but we were just too late for this elephant. Following that, another email that said that the whole elephant snare roll was found, that was very inspiring for us and our students, because this meant that now we had found an elephant snare roll and removed them. So poachers were active in that area, and hopefully this meant that some elephants were saved, and then a set of 10 antelope snares. This was done just one month prior to an AI conference deadline, so this was a, a good result in the sense that having found this, we could 
uh, go ahead and publish our uh, results. But this is always a challenging task to push AI research forward and hopefully provide results that are he helpful for SMART. And this is a domain that has allowed us to do both. So with that, I'm going to hand this over to Bistra. So after this uh, uh, initial field tests, uh, we actually deployed a much larger scale uh, field test in two parks, uh, the Queen Elizabeth National Park and then in Murchison Falls a little bit later. So as Milin mentioned, we identified areas which had previously been not patrolled at all or in very infrequently patrolled. So in a sense, there was no really uh, very good understanding about uh, the poaching risk in these areas. And using our uh, predictive models based on the historic data from SMART, we uh, recommended uh, these areas to be patrolled and we divided them into areas which the model said were high risk and areas which the model said were low risk. But without telling the rangers which is which, we essentially gave them the whole set of uh, areas that, uh, to, to patrol. And after six months of uh, of patrolling these areas uh, based on the, the data that they provided, we evaluated what was the outcome. And as you can see, the squares, uh, the snares per squ uh, patrol square, uh, um, square kilometer in the high risk area was much higher than in the low risk area. Similarly, in the Murchison Falls, where we divided the uh, recommended areas into high, medium, and low risk, again, we saw a very dramatic statistical difference between how much on average snares were found in these areas for the same amount of effort. So that was a very important validation for us that uh, our models are in fact really working in the field. And again, here is something that, uh, uh, why this kind of machine learning and predictive model-based approaches are important because based on historic data, we can extrapolate and, and learn where else uh, we might need to deploy our resources. Just plotting hotspots based on previous patrol data is not enough. Uh, but with the actual modeling, we can, we can uh, have a much clearer picture across the whole uh, park area. So more recently, uh, we have partnered with SMART to really expand the application of our two poles uh, to many more parks. Uh, and we are working with some of the partner uh, conservation organizations such as WWF, WCS, and uh, ZSL to test our predictive models on many more parks. We have done uh, four so far and we have another three in the works. Um, and we are basically trying to see uh, how our tool performs across a variety of parks, small, large, with high uh, uh, rate of illegal activity and low rate, with a lot of data and with little data, et cetera, in order to really uh, see the readiness of, of this approach to be scaled up uh, uh, um, more globally. And so we are hoping that with this, uh, uh, we are actually going to go ahead and integrate uh, our uh, pause method as, a, as, a, as part of the SMART tool. And with that, it's going to be available for any of the current 600 national parks that are using SMART to actually use uh, the machine learning um, and patrolling methodologies that we've implemented in the field. Um, so beyond uh, patrol uh, range, um, um, uh, ranger patrolling uh, scheduling, we're also, oh, sorry, once, uh, yeah. So um, I forgot one extra point is that we have also provided our tool as a uh, uh, API available on the Microsoft Azure <coughs> Cloud. So in this way, it's actually accessible to any organization that wants to leverage our tool beyond uh, the smart partnership. We're also working on uh, um, enabling uh, other types of um, um, anti-poaching activities with AI uh, algorithms in particular, UAVs are uh, starting to get used more and more uh, in the field. So during the night, uh, uh, some uh, NGO organizations such as the Air Shepherd provide a service where they drive a van, they uh, um, uh, get the UAV out in the air and then uh, technicians sit in the van looking at the video streaming real time trying to see whether there's poachers in the field and if they detect anything they actually call the rangers to go and get them. However, this is extremely tiring and, and, and very difficult to see in these black and white videos, low resolution with jitter from the camera. Um, 
And so what we have done is developed uh, an AI-based system that actually automatically processes these videos in real time and is able to identify uh, both rangers and, and, and animals in these videos and helps them uh, more effectively do their job. So I think this is all from me, from the USC side. Pardon. Thank you, Bistra. Uh, so um, I, I'm just going to wrap up. Uh, by uh, summarising some of what we, we've heard about already. Uh, and the work at the University of York has been a sort of parallel um, evolution to, to what you've heard about from the University of Southern California. So what, where we're at the moment uh, is that uh, we know we can take data from rangers uh, using the smart database, which is the sort of thing we heard about at first. We know we can to some degree, remove some of the biases and challenges involved in that to fill in the gaps between where rangers uh, already know they need to be patrolling and identify places where they, they aren't at the moment. Um, uh, and we also know that in the field, we can make differences. So uh, I'm just going to reiterate that and um, bring it down to earth a little bit for, for a second. Uh, so we also worked in uh, Queen Elizabeth National Park um, using a slightly different algorithm for predicting where, where poaching is going on. Um, and you see the sort of results on the top left that we get a hotspot map of, uh, in this case, commercial animal poaching, and we know from SMART where effort is currently being allocated. So what we're trying to do is not increase necessarily the, the, po uh, the ranger effort, but make it more efficient, wh whatever we're spending at the moment. Um, and so we, we took, uh, over a three-month period, we, we monitored the rates uh, at which illegal activities were detected by ranger posts, three ranger posts uh, in, in some part of the park and another three uh, or five uh, elsewhere. So the bottom graph on the left-hand side. Uh, we watched what the rate was for three months and then we started uh, using our, our maps to intervene. And we gave them targets, say, go find these places uh, where we think you're going to find lots uh, for half of those ranger posts uh, at random and the other half uh, or for three, and then the other ones we didn't. Um, and we found that detection rates uh, of the sorts of snares uh, and things that people were looking for uh, are increased substantially. So uh, I just wanted to show you what the snare was, because some of you might not have seen one. So I've got here, um, this is a hippopotamus snare, uh, which is one of the things we found, and one of the lives we didn't save, because I'm afraid there was a hippo in there. Um, but they, they get attached to microphones and other field pieces of equipment at one end that won't move when you catch a hippo, walks in, uh, around the neck in Tanzania, through the foot, uh, mainly in Uganda, uh, and then it tightens up, and it's a rather unpleasant uh, way to die. Um, so that's what uh, we're finding a lot more of, up to five times as many uh, of these types of snares or other signs of acti illegal activity, depending on what we're targeting. And as uh, Andy made uh, clear at the beginning, if you want to use these methods to uh, direct patrol activity, you have to force the rangers or the managers to make a very explicit decision. I'm going to prioritize this type of poaching over this type of poaching. Uh, whereas a lot of the time, rangers tend to prefer the bits that are fairly easy. They know if they're going to go and find a, uh, an elephant poacher, they're armed. It's not much fun. If they just go and pick up someone who's got a snare for a, a, a wildebeest, that's easy. They get whatever rewards are being given and, and that. So, um, so making the, the patrol strategy decisions at a, a higher level uh, is, is a, a, and, and making it that explicit uh, is a good way to avoid some of the problems that, that we, we don't want to see. Um, uh, and finally, uh, this is just an overview of what's going on. We have the smart database uh, behind things. We can use various forms of AI uh, to produce maps of hotspots. Uh, we can then use further levels of AI, um, uh, artificial intelligence, to ultimately develop a map, hopefully, of where you should be patrolling, when you should be patrolling, and whatever. And then that can come through whatever smart device people are using in the field. Rangers say, OK, this is your route. We can allocate your route this morning once you've set off. Uh, now you, this is where you're going. And ultimately, we end up finding more snares or whatever it is we're targeting uh, as a result of this. Um, so we can identify the pattern. We prioritize the competing requirements uh, over 
which uh, ranges that are doing, we plan our targets. And what we want to do now, uh, and what I really value your feedback on uh, and questions about, are um, what do we need? If, you're, if you work with ranges, uh, would you rather have actual routes planned, or would you just have sort of target locations, goals to get to? How much detail can we take this? There's a lot of work in this little box here that, that hasn't happened yet, and, and in this, this bit down here. Uh, that's where we're working now, so that we can take what, what is already a really useful resource in SMART and then make it add on this predictive uh, and feedback mechanism that, that says, go to these places. Um, so we want to know what features are required to make things useful. What would rangers like to see? Uh, and uh, what is ex exactly the priority in, in doing this? Um, what are the practical challenges that we're ignoring? We're, we know that there are other things that rangers are being asked to do. You know? They might need to go to a team meeting on Wednesday afternoon. So we have to build that into our route somewhere. Or we know that there's uh, other stuff that, that we don't know about. Um, you know, we've got a range of experience here, but you've got a far wider experience. So please tell us, what would you like to know? Um, uh, and then are there other ethical considerations uh, that we're, we're ignoring, we haven't even considered, that we need to build in somehow within the, the uh, artificial intelligence process uh, that we want to go about. So those are just a few of the suggested topics for discussion. We've got uh, about half an hour, I think. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Good. Um, okay, we've got a, a pile of hands coming up. Uh, I'm going to start uh, over there with the, the tie. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, and I think I'll take two at a time and we'll pass them out and then we'll, we'll come back. So. This one. Uh, there's another one just here, and then, then we'll answer those and we'll pick up more. Yeah. I think I'm going to uh, ask Bistra and uh, Milan to answer the first one, and then perhaps Rohit, can you pick up a second? So uh, let me go first. So I guess the questions you asked are really awesome. Uh, the first one with respect to tracking elephants or understanding their trails and using that data. I mean, that's something that we haven't done but would be very exciting to include in the model. And in many of these cases, it's really a question of us I mean, we AI researchers uh, would love to collaborate. We, interdisciplinary collaboration is really crucial. And we'd love to figure out how to incorporate that data and what kind of models exist. So that would, that's absolutely fantastic. With respect to game uh, theoretic model, that's very near and dear to my heart. So it's really something very, very interesting. The kind of models that we've used are so-called Stackelberg models, where essentially what we assume is that the adversary already knows what we're doing. So we're saying they know what kind of patrols we're doing. 
and they're reacting to that. And so as such, um, the security is through randomness than through secrecy. But indeed, the idea here is that the adversaries are, uh, are able to observe or react, uh, what we are doing and then respond intelligently. Some of the things that you're mentioning with uh, poachers use of drones and so forth, I mean, it's frightening. I guess uh, I wasn't aware of that, but certainly those are the kinds of things that we would love to figure out how to incorporate those in our model as well. So very, very fascinating uh, uh, things to think about and I would love to discuss further. Yeah, I guess uh, only one point, like in terms of uh, the, the first part of the question about the dynamics of the elephants, so far we are using things like animal density for specific species, but not uh, like dynamics necessarily. Like we are not incorporating, for example, that maybe the elephants themselves also might react to the ranger movements, but we are using some density maps. Right, uh, so, I am loud enough. <laughs> uh, so, uh, in the beginning, when SMART was launched in 2011, January to be precise, it was designed mainly for ranger patrols, and it was designed for protected area management. But now it's being used for all kinds of purposes. Like communities are using it for community protected areas. I know 17 community protected areas in Cambodia where SMART is being used. Uh, it's, they are using pen and paper because they are not as tax heavy as rangers. Uh, also, it's uh, being used in non-protected areas uh, in Bhutan. It's being used in conservancies in Africa. So yes, it's, it's the use of SMART is expanding and, and uh, it's being used not just in inviolate co zone but in various type of areas. Like in Bhutan, they are using it for monitoring the timber they allow to extract, they, the community is allowed to extract anyway. So they are using SMART to monitor uh, timber extraction in non-protected areas by the community. So yeah, it's available and it's being used for, for all kind of purposes now. Trig, do you want to add anything to that? Or? No, I mean, I think Rohit summed it up. I mean, ultimately the use of SMART wouldn't change the ranger, I mean, it would change the ranger behavior and perhaps in, in efficiency of patrols, but they would still be out there doing the job that they were previously doing. So the ethical considerations I don't think would change. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think I'm going to take, uh, I saw Henry at the front here and then a second one here and then I'll, we'll carry on, got lots of time. <laughs> And the second one over here. So this is, uh, my name is Dan Brockington from the University of Sheffield. Three very quick questions, which are uh, all one question. First of all, people talk a lot about building in local knowledge into uh, conservation action. How does SMART do that? Secondly, um, is it better than building um, assets, surveillance, uh, people with informants in, in, in groups who can tell you where the poaching is going on? Thirdly, um, Andrew Bamford published a paper a while ago which um, published equations for how much it costs to protect protected areas. It was fascinating because you could protect 92% of the category one to four protected areas in Africa with around about $64 million according to those equations. Very cheap. Just smart bring that down. And it's one question altogether because this is a really interesting panel because none of you have mentioned value of the money. Does investing in smart improve conservation So I could start with the first question, hand it over to Bistra, and then I guess we can let smart people handle the questions that were asked here. 
So uh, a very interesting question. There's not going to be a single machine learning model uh, that's going to dominate across the globe in all parts, uh, all kinds of environments and so forth. So I think we need, we need to you know, have a thousand flowers bloom and all that and bring multiple models all into SMART. And then essentially uh, figure out which one is going to work well where. So I don't anticipate that uh, our model necessarily will be the best model to deploy. And in fact, in our model, there are multiple machine learning techniques that we are using and then picking the one that would work. So the idea would be that we would include multiple of these models and automatically inside run some tests and say, you know, this is the model that appears to work best based on previous history, but give that option of it, uh, to the rangers to pick other models if they're sophisticated enough uh, in some case to, to sort of, or they want to get into those details and try and sort this out, but otherwise automatically say, this is the model that seems to work better. So we've, uh, we were actually engaged in an exercise of trying to compare these different models on different data sets and what works well where and so on. So it's very much uh, along the lines of uh, what we've been trying to do. But as I said, I mean, we don't anticipate that one will dominate the other everywhere around the world. Uh, Tariq, do you want to? Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll touch on both. Mm. So let's start with that question. Um, from the smart perspective, we just want everybody to, you know, play in the sandbox and be happy and get, the, you know, get the best tool possible. Um, so, f so for us, I mean, um, this is this is still early days for for the the predictive aspects of Smart. But uh, I mean, we had uh, we had I think a really productive meeting in in May this year, and it was the folks here plus additional people uh, that are not on the panel. Uh, all of which are taking different approaches to answering this question. Um, and so from our perspective, we're not, um, you know, we're not selecting tool A and tool B because tool A, uh, and I think these guys can, can say this as well, um, you know, may work really great in Uganda, but doesn't really work well in, in Nigeria, you know, and, and um, you know, might work in Africa, but not Asia. And so what we want to do is provide users with a tool set um, that's relatively functional and simple to use and can uh, encompass a lots, of, lots of different approaches um, to, to make the best decision possible. Um, to answer your question, um, in hard numbers, I can't, I can't give you a simple answer, but what I think I, I can say, two points. So one, SMART by itself doesn't do any of the things that we're talking about, right? So SMART is just a software tool. It's, and, and you know, a hammer can hammer a nail, but a hammer can also break a window. And you know, so I think what's really key and what I think um, needs, needs to be you know, sort of driven home is just implementing SMART does not then make a protected area function. And so uh, you know, where SMART has been implemented well, um, we've seen lots of positive results uh, you know, uh, across Africa, Asia, Latin America, we've seen increases in, um, you know, the success of patrols, so increased uh, detection of whatever they're looking for, you know, in, in a particular site, increased populations, it's been really successful with uh, tiger populations in, in Asia. Um, in, uh, you know, just off the top of my head, there's a couple marine sites that have reported um, significant improvements in, in, in fuel usage uh, by, by improving where they're going out on their, uh, their boat patrols. Um, so can I say SMART is better than X? No, but I mean the, the principle of SMART is you, you're doing patrols at a site. How do you better, how do you improve upon those, those you know, the deployment of those patrols? If you have $100,000, how do you make the best use of that $100,000? And that's, that's what we're trying to get at. And I think the results would suggest that, that it, it does. Uh, and, and the, you know, the, across the board, it's been pretty positive when SMART is used uh, well and, you know, and, and, and applied in a way that's in, in, in keeping with what we consider the, uh, the SMART approach. Um, and then just, although it's not published yet, there's Anthony uh, is, Anthony Dancer's here. Uh, he's doing a pretty comprehensive review of SMART uh, globally and, um, well, again, it's not published, but the preliminary results suggest that, uh, you know, when applied well, uh, SMART uh, does lead to, um, you know, improvements in, in effectiveness and um, 
conservation outcomes. And then finally, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service did a review of SMART implementation in uh, Central Africa in their funded projects in Central Africa. And, and the take homes there were, like I said, SMART's not a silver bullet. Um, and it can't be considered a silver bullet. Uh, but generally speaking, where SMART was applied, there was improvements in, in, in outcomes at those sites when, when applied correctly. Well, I'm a primatologist, so I can't speak to <laughs> the economics of it, but um, I don't know, Rohit, you've got more experience with, with smart implementation on the ground. I mean, what, what's your sense? Uh, well, uh, it, again, it's, it's, if, if you think smart, that's the misconception. I think a lot of people have that if I start using smart, that's going to solve all my problems, which is wrong. Smart is just one way of handling your patrols or managing your law enforcement effort. You still need to do your intelligence. If you do just intelligence, invest $20,000 in intelligence, and then you imagine that there is going to be a robot that's going to act on that intelligence, that's also not going to work. So you need to do everything you need to uh, make your protected area more effective. In terms of the actual investment that goes into smart, uh, smart as such doesn't cost you anything. What it costs you is, is that some trainings and the patrol which you are anyway doing. But what costs you money is when you start identifying gaps. Let me give you an example. If SMART produces a map and it says that rangers are not doing patrol in the north and they are not doing night patrols in the north, now you have to build a ranger station because rangers can't spend night there. So that's going to cost you money. But SMART does it, it tells you, it identifies the gap. So I don't think it's like, we, we can go into the discussion of how much does it cost, but in, in my opinion, I think, I have a simple, I'm a, I'm a field person, so I have simple criteria that any technology, whether whichever technology you use, it has to fit into three criteria. Usable, scalable, affordable. If it doesn't work, fit into those three criteria, then it's useless. And SMART easily does that. It is usable because rangers can understand it, it's affordable, and also it is user-driven. That's the most important part. It's not us deciding what should be the new function of SMART, like intelligence, you use the word intelligence. Uh, intelligence, plugin came out because users were saying that we are not able to effectively manage or record our intelligence network. And that's how the plugin on intelligence came up. So it's the user-driven tool, and that makes it more effective. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna use the, the chair's privilege for one second uh, to answer the, the other half of, of Henry's question, um, which was, uh, can SMART um, stop people from phoning Rangers, <laughs> I think he can answer it himself. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's at, actually very linked to that question. Do we put money into taking phones off Rangers uh, versus do we put money into intelligence versus do we put money into more efficient uh, Rangers? That, that's uh, a sort of separate thing. As you know, I think has been made clear, SMART isn't a solution to everything. Um, yeah, parks need managing properly. Um, and rangers need appropriate management as well. So uh, there were more questions. I know there's one right at the front here, and then there's one at the back there. And I'll take those two. And uh, yeah, I've got I've got some more lined up. <laughs> Thank you. Those ones that are, are not actually more than areas. <laughs> 
a lot is happening. And my question is, are the ranges uh, from the government or from the communities that are being monitored? Because there are those ranges that are being employed to manage the conservancies, uh, which are, I think, from the communities themselves. And they are, again, ranges that are employed by the government. So who are these ranges? especially when lethal force can be involved. Um, could you give an idea of what sort of ethical oversight you currently have or might be planning to implement? So I'm going to pass Rohit, the first one, I think, if that's yeah. okay. Uh, and um, this is going to get the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so when we, as I, I was mentioning to Tristan, uh, when we started with SMART, it was designed for rangers, and these rangers are mostly government employees. But now it's expanding to the non-government employee or the community protected areas. So it's, for example, it's in Indonesia, it's being used by community rangers because the government ranger numbers are too low. I, let me give you an example. There's a park called Rimambaling Wildlife Reserve. It's 1,500 square kilometer with one government ranger. So you can't manage that park. So their communities are running most of the patrols. And, and that SMART is used by local communities. Also, a lot of the uh, parks in Asia where uh, community protected areas, which is the same as your conservancies, communities are using it. It's, it's improving, and, and I think what we need to do, and which will happen with the new mobile application of SMART, uh, the earlier mobile application was not very user-friendly for uh, not very tax-savvy local communities, but the new mobile application will make that happen will allow uh, local communities to gather data more effectively. We are also looking into integration of the ranger pet smart and the community smart. So information that range, uh, communities are gathering goes into the same smart system which rangers are using. So we can bring these two groups together because without communities, you can't save the protected data. It's not going to work. So that's why we are using smart to bring these two groups together also. Excellent. I'm just going to interrupt before Bistra has a go. Uh, I've got a message saying, can we make sure that um, questions have microphones because our live streamers can't hear them? So I'm just going to repeat the, the next one, which was uh, from someone who used to be a ranger, uh, asking about the ethical implications of lethal force and how the artificial intelligence component, uh, how far we've thought about ethical implications of using AI within a context where there may potentially be lethal force applied. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a very tough question, I guess. <laughs> so, I guess currently, right now, I think most of our modeling has really not gotten it to at that point at all. So, what we're trying to, what we've done so far is use historic data of where illegal activity has been found and try to create models that essentially relate landscape features to where more poaching might be happening, right? So, and we are able to predict different types of, of uh, illegal activities. But, uh, yeah, we haven't, I don't, it will be very difficult to, to directly integrate into the predictive models of poaching something about lethal force. It would, this kind of reasoning, I believe, will come more as a, how do we use these models, right? So if we're going to be sending people to places where we believe there could be uh, a poaching happening where the poachers might have guns and, you know, uh, there could be a conflict, then that has to be, in a sense, somehow incorporated on the management levels of how, how the, the patrolling should be scheduled. But so if I may just uh, add briefly to what Bistra has been saying. I mean, it's a really excellent question. It's really important for us to understand the ethical uh, aspects. I mean, we've been very involved uh, with uh, ethical considerations, particularly as we've worked with uh, law enforcement agencies uh, in the U.S. And so some of the things that are very important, of course, is uh, as we roll this out uh, to other parts and so forth, interpretability, that the models have to be understood. And that's been something that uh, the two of us have been trying very hard to ensure that this is not some model that nobody understands what is going on. And so ensuring that uh, people understand the reasoning, the logic behind the system, that's been one of our uh, prime uh, pushes in our research. And hopefully that will help. 
but ultimately, as Peter was saying, community participation, uh, and by community I mean all of the, those who are present here, as well as uh, the real community in which it's getting used, is also very important. And these are very interdisciplinary and complex questions that AI researchers around the world are struggling with, and something very important for us to take into account as we move forward. But from a research side, interpretability is something that we are tackling right away as the first step towards that goal. And then from, from the SMART perspective, um, you know, I mentioned earlier there's 600 some odd sites. Um, if you drill down into that set of sites, the, the vast majority of those are either directly um, involved with one of the nine partner members or you know, it's one step removed from one of the, the nine partner members. Um, and our approach is you know, we provide the tools and, and the services um, but we always try to, to, to guide the implementation, right? And so, so we provide a lot of documentation on the, you know, quote unquote, best practices, you know, recommended use. We have um, some printed materials on, you know, things you should consider before you use functionality X, you know, at a, at a site. I mean, and if you're using something for ecological monitoring, it doesn't really, you know, lethal force is not an issue for, uh, you know, I don't know, counting trees, but the, the, from our perspective, what we try to do is provide our users with as much support as possible um, to be able to implement the the tool as as good as possible, right? Because it's only as good as its implementation. Um, and yeah, the, it is hard to have to be able to say because it's free, freely available, and it's open source to say that we have any sort of um, you know, complete control over the implementation of the of, of the the software itself. But 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 our approach has always been to try to support um, to the greatest extent possible um, as many sites as we as we can through the, the the broader partner network. Excellent. I think we have time for just two more. Uh, and I don't know, since the beginning. yeah, there's one over there, and I know there was someone here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and I'm afraid your microphone has just run over there. <laughs> hey, First of all, thanks very much, Zella. Mm -hmm. um, thanks very much for this. It was very useful for me personally working with ranges as part of my PhD. I'm really interested in the, the data side of things and the quantitative elements. Um, but my question is going to focus more on the qualitative side of things because I went to the field initially conceiving of having a quantitative focus of research and I realized something along the lines of what Rohit said about um, what, would, what would you ask God for if he came to this park <laughs> to know what our data is being used for. Um, and I found that to be the case. I interviewed 22 rangers in Zimbabwe and many of them weren't aware of how data were being used. So this is data on elephant um, they weren't aware of how data were being used, and when asked, what, what would you do if you didn't know? And one of the rangers said, you know, go back and get, collect data with a punch. And so they, they really would, rangers seem to be motivated by knowledge about what their, their data is, is informing. And within, sorry, the question is more about the, the implementation of something like SMART. And one of the, the supervisors I spoke to in the Zambezi Valley in Zimbabwe said, graph or no graph, I know how to manage my area an older gentleman, very experienced, and he, so, and the issue of data appreciation and the value of data and what data can be used for is something that we take for granted, but I think in these implementation environments it's, it's not always taken for granted and people would far rather rely on something that they've been using for years, like the map and pins in the, in the operations room, um, and then things like not having carcass patrol forms printed because, um, because the printer cartridge had run out. Um, and then one of the one of the managers said, when, when is SMART going to give us the results of our analysis back? And so there's this, yeah, how do you get around those those social elements of buy-in and ownership um, into something like, like SMART? I mean, it's technically brilliant, and I'm glad to hear it's been working in so many areas, but how, have you faced similar issues, and, and how do you get around them? Okay, I'm going to very quickly ask for this one, and then we're going to have to be really quick. Uh, do you want to shout and I'll repeat it, if it's a short one, or you can wait. <laughs> it's just coming. Um, actually, more, more or less preempted my, my, my question, which, which um, right at the end of the 
actually, mine was almost more a comment. I was instrumental in introducing SMART into one particular area of Thailand, working with WCS. And one of the things I found really, really interesting is a completely unexpected consequence was the professionalization, if you look, well, it's the wrong word, the ranger team, the, this terrific ranger team, dispirited, disheartened, often unpaid, badly paid, uh, neglected, not properly respected, all villagers. Somehow, the training that went with SMART, the, the physical training, the military training, which was how to stay safe, how to prepare for ambush, how to, what, you know, th that side of it, and how to use, how to collect the data, how to recycle. They themselves started to feel so much more self-respecting and respected. It really had a transformational effect also in their relationship with the community, as did working with a, a community nearby who, who used becoming uh, 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 smart rangers to protect the land, not only against poachers, but against outside land grabbers. So they were protecting themselves as well. So I found that so interesting, is it, and, and whether you had predicted this or expected it, that the unexpected consequences of smart were in many ways bigger than, the, 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 than what we've been talking about. Excellent, thank you. Rohit, 30 seconds for the last word. Time start now. Okay. Uh, uh, so I think you're absolutely right, sir. As a tool, it's great, but if it's not used effectively, then it's not going to work. Uh, I always say smart is a tool, it's not a weapon. But if you use it with the proper training, with, in proper condition, then it can be a weapon. All those operational challenges we need to address. What we are doing within WWF also is reviewing every single site where the smart is being used. So if the reports are being produced and they are sitting in park manager's office and not going back to the rangers, it's useless. Use Microsoft Excel. That is an easier way to manage data. Uh, what we are doing is, you know, those benefits of bringing these reports. I have seen myself when you print the metro patrol map and put it at the ranger station, rangers proudly show that to their park managers to see, this was my last month patrol. So we need to bring all those operational side, we need to strengthen the operational uh, side of SMART, that's where we are working at the training task force within SMART. So we're not only building the training material, how to use a software, but how to operationalize SMART effectively. We are also coming up with the standards. So these are the standards you need to match if you really want to use SMART effectively, not just installing a com software in your computer is going to solve all the problem. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd just like to say thank you all for uh, your questions, your engagement uh, this morning, and thank you to everyone who mostly come a very long way and uh, on very little sleep, uh, so thank you all. <laughs>